Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, In-House Technology Development for Next Gene Sequencing, Tissue Handling and Beyond at the BC Cancer Agency, presented by Robin Koop, an instrumentation group leader at BC Cancer Agency Genome Center. Um, I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that today's presentation is interactive. We want to hear from you, so questions, comments, they can be submitted via the green Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of our presentation. Also, you are viewing the presentation in a slide window. To enlarge that window, click on the icon at the lower right-hand corner of your slide window. If you cannot hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or the Q&A button and let us know that you're having a problem. Without further ado, let me turn our presentation over to Robin Koop. Welcome, sir. Center in Vancouver. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about some of the automation and other sort of custom device uh, development that we do here at the uh, Genome Sciences Center. Um, I should say I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, automated site selection, uh, and I am a board member of a spin-off company we have called Coastal Genomics uh, in that area. Uh, the outline of my talk is uh, to talk about liquid handling strategies at the Genome Sciences Center that we um, are employing here as a fairly large-scale automation effort. Uh, some of the in-house projects we do, smaller projects, a, a big in-house project called Automated Size Selection. Uh, talk a little bit about how we do prototyping, because I think we, we have some unique capabilities there that, that I believe other people should have. Um, uh, a little bit about automated methods for improving tumor content, which is kind of our current big project and, and built a lot on the uh, things that we've learned from the uh, uh, previous projects, big projects we've done. And uh, finally, then, the lessons that we've learned from those big projects and how we're applying them now. Um, liquid handling robotics at the GSC, we are uh, one of Canada's largest genome sciences centers, uh, genome, genomic sequencing facilities. Uh, so our, our primary focus is really on, on cancer, and we do a mixture of uh, research samples. And, and not just cancer, we do, do many other things, de novo genomes and bacterial genomes. We do also um, uh, a, a variety of uh, not just whole genomes, but a lot of RNA-seq as well. Uh, so we have a variety of... Um, of, of, of different strategies. I should say we also do clinical sequencing, and uh, that also is primarily right now of uh, various targeted strategies. So, so this actually means there's a number of pipelines, but they're pipelines that are all related fundamentally in the DNA sequencing library construction on Illumina, and really most other sequencers, is basically the same. You have a number of steps where you make small fragments somehow of DNA, which may have come from RNA, or may have come from FFPE, or may have come from a uh, whole genome that's fresh, you make them small, you add adapters, and then you uh, have to do some purification or potentially some amplification and quantification. Um, so we, in fact, have, uh, it's hard to keep track, but somewhere between seven and nine strategies uh, or primary pipelines, the whole genome PCR free from fresh tissue, what we call small gap, which is libraries used for capture, uh, such as primarily exomes, but any targeted capture panel, um, strand-specific RNA-seq for microRNA isolated um, microRNA isolation or ribodepletion. So there's some different ways coming into uh, RNA to, 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 to get um, mRNA, which you then are turning into cDNA and sequencing, uh, some, some epigenomics strategies, uh, and then FFP and frozen tissue as an input, which of course means, um, I'm sorry, FFPE as distinct from frozen tissue where you have uh, fragmented libraries, which may also be damaged, which requires some different steps. Um, and now an emerging thing is circulating cell-free DNA, which is generally small fragments of double-stranded DNA that have to be purified and then are maybe in small abundance or the part, part you're looking at for non-invasive prenatal testing or potentially cancer uh, are, are, are small fragments um, or small fractions of the total that you're looking for. All these need to be in version-controlled pipelines. Uh, and we have uh, a, a bunch of different robots because you've got DNA, you've got, you've got tissue extraction and RNA processing, and then you've got pre-PCR activities and you've got post-PCR activities. Um, and you've got quantification and rearraying potentially upstream and downstream. Uh, that produces a lot of code. The strategy we use uh, is to have, uh, first of all, harmonize our, our robots as much as we can, and then harmonize our uh, library construction methods. So the robot harmonization 
uh, has been to, to, we've migrated from an older generation of human genome project era, a, a set of uh, biomic robots. Um, and for a variety of reasons that aren't important, uh, we have gone to some different robots currently. We will shortly have uh, our final platform or, or system we're looking at for the next few years, which is a Perkinolmer Janus upstream and a mini Janus at the very end uh, of the pipeline, and then seven Nimbuses, Hamilton Nimbus robots in the middle. So what we have is for biospecimens, uh, which means quantification and rearrays, we have this Janus upstream. And then we have a couple of robots in tissue extraction and, and RNA processing, three robots in pre-PCR activities, two uh, robots in, in post-PCR activities, uh, which is primarily uh, uh, cleanups, post-PCR cleanups and quantification. And then uh, a, a Janus, another Janus at the end for uh, some qPCR setup and pooling, which goes into DNA sequencing. Um, we wish to automate uh, the whole thing, so as much as possible, extraction, quantification, normalization, library construction, and pooling. Um, we want to automate liquid transfers. Uh, we're not currently thinking about, or we, we haven't worked on uh, automating or completely walkway automation so that we have incubation automated at this point. So we set, we set up plates with reactions, and then we uh, incubate them. And so there's a certain amount of manual activity in there. Um, but we use, uh, uh, we're, we're thinking about going in that direction. And finally, and most importantly in a way, currently with next-gen sequencing, we're using a lot of relatively, we have lots of sample sets which aren't whole plates. So there's lots of subplate work that needs to be, you would still desirably do it in an automated way and not manually. And so we're uh, using very much offset pipetting to handle a range of batch sizes. So we can go anywhere from within a column of, of a plate to an entire plate. What that looks like is shown in this slide where you have the robot simply pick up uh, one column of tips or two or three columns of tips and then you can process as many samples as you want. This is picking up out of a Covaris uh, two BRAC, which is for shearing DNA, which is another tricky pipetting thing that we've um, built some hardware, custom hardware for, uh, for automating. So you can see there's lots of work can go into automating some of these tricky steps. Um, so this means that we can process uh, any batch size of samples, and it currently, particularly if you think about whole genome sequencing for cancer, um, panel sequencing, or or you know our big personalized oncogenomics research project, we're 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 trying to we're typically going to be batching uh, quite often, and therefore we often want to batch at maybe 24 samples or 48 samples, and not batch at 96 samples because we need to turn around samples you know within a one week time frame. Of course, this is going to depend on the size of the jurisdiction that you're doing these things in, but in British Columbia. Um, with our scale of our publicly funded clinical panel sequencing uh, activity in the in the health system, it makes sense to batch at this sort of subplate volume, and, and and so it's quite important to do offset pipetting and therefore efficiently run these pipelines. Um, so anyway, we've got all of these pipelines that are basically doing library construction, and so we want to harmonize these things uh, in order to not have an absolute nightmare of code control. And you can imagine that we are talking about uh, seven. Uh, or nine or whatever, depending how you count it, uh, different pipelines, and we're talking about all of them having bead purifications and reaction setups. And if you if you if you start to let those things drift and use different parameters in different pipelines, it, it, you, you from a from a code management point of view, this is an absolute nightmare. Um, also, what it means is you can you can abandon old pipelines that haven't been worked on for a while. They they can actually become sort of uh, increasingly, relatively speaking, much more inefficient, and you, and you end up having an old pipeline that has a, dramatically too much DNA going into it by modern standards. And so keeping all this stuff moving forward and yet under control is a challenge. So here's, the, here's what we're doing, right? Obtain DNA and RNA fresh, uh, from fresh tissue or, or FFPE uh, or cell-free DNA. Um, and then you go, you make DNA, or if you have RNA, then you do end repair, you do bead purification, you uh, do a additional ligation PCR for some libraries, not all. Uh, you do then some kind of purification, which could be a size selection, what, uh, purification out of the adapters and maybe some tighter size selection, and then at the end you do some QC. Um, so what we've done is actually write, uh, this is primarily on Nimbus, uh, we write this programming structure where the red steps that you see here are actually all one method. So are the red in the column, uh, be clean of all sorts, is basically one method that has different volumes passed to it as arguments depending on what pipeline you're in and the amount of sample you have and, and in some cases the, the size of the fragment that you're dealing with because they can vary a little bit. Um, and the blue steps are the same reaction setups. And as you can see, if you look along the, the columns, we have strand-specific cDNA synthesis, we have, um, well, this is a SSRNA-seq, 
we have PCR enriched uh, whole genome chip by sulfide gDNA from FFP, PCR free, and so forth. Uh, and so they all have slightly different steps, uh, but you can actually manage this with one program. So what this looks like for the user is the uh, on the left you see the the first window that they would see, which is please select library type, uh, and then once you select one of those, we selected PCR free in this case. It asks what stage of library construction are you doing because you may have stopped part way through, uh, and and then you can go ahead and then it produces pictures of uh, the 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 deck layouts that you that you should have at that point, and so people lay things out on the decks. Our technologists and uh, we run from there. Um, so so. This, uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of advantages to this in, in that you can really uh, kind of keep track of best practices to, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find it, you'll, you'll potentially find errors in, in one pipeline, but you realize those errors will potentially propagate to other pipelines, so you catch them first. Maybe it's a downside that they do propagate to other pipelines, but in fact they, because um, uh, if they were all isolated, they wouldn't. But in fact, you catch the errors quickly, and so you can quickly make everything better in all pipelines. Um, so on that note, uh, yeah, the big thing, 10, le 10 times less code to manage probably, um, or something on that, that, that scale. Uh, keep your B clean parameters and reaction setup as good as they can be. Um, you can catch errors quickly. Uh, the downside is it, 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 it's potentially less flexible if new methods arrive and you have to bring them into the harmonized strategy. Um, that probably would have been a bigger problem maybe four or five years ago, but, but we've started to see a certain amount of maturing of library construction uh, methods where particularly bead purification, for example, we've, we've, we've gotten, we think, really good at it, and, and we, we, we don't really see those, bead, those, those, those purification strategies um, uh, changing a lot or the pipetting methods changing a lot. So you have some little things. You may add, you know, different, different reagents, different enzymes, and different reaction steps, but the, but the pipetting methods are, are, are fundamentally, the architecture is the same, so we can add steps and keep it within the overall harmonized uh, structure. And, and from, from my point of view as the, the leader of the people who are responsible for managing the code, I'm, I'm very satisfied with the, the harmonization uh, strategy. So I want to talk about some in-house engineering projects we do. My, my group actually has four people. It has two engineers uh, come actually from engineering training and two uh, folks from biology who have good programming skills, one of whom is an is a absolute master of Excel, uh, which is kind of neat because, of course, in high throughput genomics, we're always battling between Excel and, and uh, sort of in-house laboratory uh, uh, information management systems. Uh, but anyway, we've got a great team. Uh, and so I gotta, uh, the, the, the robot programming I described to you uh, just now is, is done by largely uh, one dedicated guy who, who works hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the biology method developers, but is supported by the engineering team to do either the more difficult code uh, or um, generating custom hardware, such as when we want to pipette in and out of covaris plates or other kind of custom adapter uh, things. We've done a lot of our own incubator uh, systems, for, or um, incubators for upstream tissue extraction, for example, on deck. Uh, the engineers then also do uh, these kinds of in-house projects. Um, so, so a, a few fun examples that are fairly minor, but 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 cool. Um, this is what we call the cryo cart and the cryo crane. So essentially, we have a cart that's used for uh, uh, shipping samples. These come all of these. This is basically stuff that the cart, the the the, the cryo port goes out to uh, as far away as Uganda, gets filled with samples for a variety of projects. We've got some HIV tumor molecular characterizations and perfect lymphoma projects. They get filled with samples in Uganda, and without having to be recharged with nitrogen, they come back. So there's a lot of managing liquid nitrogen and making sure you have enough and so forth. So we built this crane structure and we won the 2012 WorkSafe BC Ergonomic Innovation Contest, uh, which got my entire team and the Biospecimens team a free lunch, so I'm proud of that. Uh, <laughs> I'm also proud of the uh, modified MySeq tray that we did. And this was a project very much driven by uh, bioinformatics, a discussion with our bioinformatics friends, who back when the MySeq was running 150 base reads, we asked, could you uh, double the reagent volume and uh, make a paradigm 300 read. And, and if you could do that, could you make a paradigm 300 read that would overlap? You make an insert that was, say, 500 bases, and then they would overlap. So as the read length declined, as you got longer and longer, you would actually have the reads uh, sort of um, merge and, and be able to be error checked against each other in the middle, in, at, the, at, the, at the distal ends of the reads, um, thereby making a five or 600 base construct uh, that that because in the end we did paradigm 500s when they went to a paradigm 250 kit, uh, and you could make these contracts that were really good for uh, de novo sequencing. And so in fact, we published this paper in Bioinformatics on assembling the 20 gigabase white spruce genome, 
uh, using this method. And as you can see, we've taken a, a reagent tray from a MySeq. This again goes back to um, about 2012. Uh, and taken a reagent tray and cut a hole in it and manufactured a larger reservoir. And we had a method for cracking open the reagent tray and then adding double the reagents from two kits and then doing these really long reads. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased with this project because it was a, a, the driver for the project came straight from bioinformatics. If you guys could do this, this would really be cool at the computational level. And so we were able to do hardware, a, a thing in hardware that gave better data in the end and, and led to some good things. Um, much bigger project now, automated size selection. Uh, this goes originally back to about 2009, but um, importantly uh, was uh, involved in the, human, in the Cancer Genome Atlas project, which has been a major project in understanding uh, molecular profiles of tumors uh, that was from around 2009 to 2000. Well, I guess it sort of continues on to this day. 2012, 13 was, was the main sample run. So the idea here was the realization that we could, with a good automation, we could do whole to whole sample separation, uh, simply put DNA, this would be a constructed library, so it's, it's fragments with an adapter, with adapters on both ends, you load them into gels, so what we have here is eight channels of gel, and you, you run them out using individual uh, control of the electric field in each, in each uh, channel, that's done with pulse width modulation. Um, you then need some kind of marker, so you, the, 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 the camera can come along and take photographs, and it can take it can identify the fraction of interest um, by looking at where it is relative to uh, some marker, which uh, and I'll tell you in a second how we did this in microRNA. And then it moves down, and you can see at the bottom there, there's an extraction well. And so the, the, the target of interest goes to the extraction well and gets pulled out. Uh, and so the, 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 the reason that you need individual control of each, of each channel uh, is that you need to actually schedule the arrival of each fragment. When we, we did it originally, we have a single channel here. so. Uh, we do that with, uh, you, you do one after another. And in fact, you, could do a, you can do 12 of these plates on the robot at one time, so this gives you 96 size selections. Now it turns out that our lab did all of the size selections for the Cancer Genome Atlas project, uh, which was on the order of 11,000 microRNAs. Um, I think in total we did a lot of micro, uh, mRNA prior, subsequent to that, and uh, so probably 20,000 samples were run on this platform. Uh, overall, the, 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 the way that microRNA size selection works or worked is that the adapter dimer is about 88 bases, and the adapter microRNA adapter construct is only about 120 or 110 bases. So we were essentially pulling out a small fragment right after the linker dimer, um, and that was uh, the adapter dimer, sorry, and, uh, and, and that's the microRNA construct that you want to sequence. And th as I say, this enabled the entire um, uh, pipeline for microRNA uh, here at the GSC. Um, so how do we do these things? Uh, I wanted to, to, to pause on the, the, the lab devices here and kind of explain a, a bit about prototyping. Uh, we have a great collaboration with the uh, cancer agency, uh, actually in lots of areas, of course, we're, we're doing clinical sequencing, we're doing all kinds of other medical collaborations um, uh, with the folks in the hospital, the ra radiation, medical physics people, um, other oncologists and so forth. Uh, one of the things we have is in the medical physics department, there is a machine shop which, which uh, with some research funding, we did a joint, we, we've, we've done a partnership to essentially upgrade their prototyping facilities and make it so we can do some amazing prototyping um, in the, right in the main uh, cancer clinic in downtown, right here in Vancouver. Um, so we've been doing this now for about 10 years. Uh, and, and, and a big part of this is actually uh, the, the, the type of prototyping we do. So. So what is effective prototyping? Well, uh, first of all, you want a quick turnaround time. So you, you need your engineers and your designers to actually be able to have the possibility of making things themselves so that they can think about a design and work on it or iterate it rapidly without having to send things away and then wait for a long time. Uh, you can just never make parts fast enough because the, the more chances you have to make and iterate designs and test them, the better your ultimate design is likely to be. Um, another problem, another sort of, uh, challenge that sort of stands in opposition to that is that your prototypes uh, in a lab like this, uh, they, they, they're not really, if you're going to build something for the lab, you need to do it efficiently, but then it needs to actually be really well finished as though it's a, it's a finished product that is something that you purchase because otherwise the lab people, they don't really want to use your crappy prototype. They want to use a, a, a thing in the lab that, that feels and looks professional. Um, uh, so, so you need to finish things properly. Um, and in fact, as a final thing, if you're going to uh, imagine doing something that might be a spin-off technology, the, 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 the cost of prototyping or, or the, 
the, the, the road to get to a thing that you could actually sell uh, ideally needs to be as short as possible because it turns out that it's, it's, it, it, the development of the prototype can be a huge part of the manufacturing cost. So if you can go in with a low uh, product cost because your, your, your development cost is low, this is super helpful. And this is very true of instruments when you have a, a small number of units that you're going to sell and you can't amortize over many, uh, you can't amortize your development cost over many uh, 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 items that you sell. Traditional prototyping, um, and these are my classic examples of a milling machine and a lathe, uh, involve uh, setting up on certain types of machines, um, more modern than these, but basically the same idea is you're cutting, you're cutting aluminum, steel, and plastic on, on milling machines and lathes. Um, the work holding, grabbing the part in such a way, and repositioning becomes a limiting step, and it takes a lot of experience. So particularly working with more challenging materials, you uh, need sort of specialized people, which requires a great deal more information transfer to 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 make those parts happen. Um, it's been realized by by not just us, but a lot of people uh, in recent times that two dimensional prototyping is a really nice thing to do. Um, and uh, so I'm going to give you an example here. This is improving a multiplay vortexer to better vortex deep 96 well blocks, which is a project that we did a long time ago. Anybody who's watching this who knows anything about sheet metal will understand that um, these these parts look like they're not very properly made, and we've gotten much, much better at sheet metal since I made these slides, but the point still very much sticks, even even maybe these slides are maybe even 10 years old. Uh, this is still basically the same. It's, it's, it's true. I'm going to uh, think about this part um, in the following way. So I'm starting with a sketch, uh, and we're thinking, okay, we want to stack three deep well blocks. These are going to be full of E. coli. We're going to shake them, um, and we're, so I'm going to make a sketch. I think this is how it's going to be. It's going to have a hinge and a lid and a latch. Uh, then I'm going to go into CAD. So CAD, of course, is is a very common thing that, that everyone has, but it, it, it's, its value can't be uh, too much overstated. It's it's really uh, where, it's, it's sort of a mechanical simulation. It's really where the rubber gets the road. And you get good at CAD, then actually you get very close to the final design on your first attempt if you're clever. And you can iterate your design then very quickly in CAD and then spit out another round of parts to test. Um, we'll isolate one part here. So this is uh, one of the end caps that is going to uh, hold these three blocks that we want. Um, what we then do is we unfold this. This is made out of sheet metal, or it's going to be made out of sheet metal. So we unfold it uh, in CAD, and that's what it looks like. We then export it to a, a program called OMAX Layout. Now, what is OMAX Layout? Well, it's the CAD program for input into an OMAX water jet cutter. Now, a water jet cutter is the most versatile of the two-dimensional prototyping tools or two-dimensional cutting tools. The more well-known ones are laser cutters and plasma cutters. but the water jet cutter is the most versatile because it can cut the widest variety of materials. In fact, it can cut anything, wood, metal, plastic, rubber, stone, glass, wood, uh, et cetera. Um, and it does so by means of a high pressure jet of water with a uh, sand entrained, an abrasive entrained in the water jet, uh, which then basically means you're cutting with a grinding tool, uh, which is why you can cut even hard materials, uh, which gives you lots of interesting options. Here, we're going to use regular old 18 gauge uh, sheet steel, which is about one and a quarter millimeters thick. Uh, we're going to cut our part out. So you can see here we've uh, we've cut it out and buffed a little few burrs off the edges. Now, again, I've, this is very beginner uh, type sheet metal, and I've I've got some slits in there to help me bend it, which I don't would, wouldn't do anymore. But that's okay. You can see the, the the metal here that we've cut it out of on the right. That goes back in the stack and gets used later. We cut those things up like Swiss cheese. Um, it's easy then to also keep a, a stock of prototype materials around because you just have sheets of different thicknesses of metal, of steel and aluminum and stainless steel and so forth. And, and, and then uh, that makes life easy as well. What I then do is I, I have access to, or I use tools that are, are, are used in sheet metal, which are benders and spot welders and so forth. And these are tools that are normally associated with mass production. So associated with car manufacturing, for example. But in those cases, you, you spend enormous effort to uh, get the, the forming tools to make exactly what you want. Here, we have some general purpose forming tools and, and welding tools. And, and with a bit of, uh, of cleverness in how we design things, we can make all kinds of things using relatively simple um, basic tools uh, or, or general purpose tools like these. So now I've bent and spot welded my thing together, and I put three deep well blocks in it. And sure enough, it looks good. Um, except it doesn't look good. It, it works, but it looks kind of uh, gross and is going to rust because it's mild steel. And so the other big thing we have is sandblasting and then in-house powder coating. Uh, we now have a much better powder coater than in this picture, but basically you're then painting this thing, and now it looks actually professional enough that you could potentially deploy it in the lab. 
uh, and people could use it and feel like they're using something that we bought and uh, it's all very good. And, and this is in fact what we do. Uh, and we have made many, many devices that we just make powder coat and put in the lab uh, and, and people happily use them. So that's a cool thing. Um, other things we do in terms of prototyping uh, that, that are important. People always ask me about 3D printing. Um, we do do a certain amount of what I call engineering 3D printing, where we 3D print uh, some particularly small components or the odd complex component uh, that would be part of another uh, com uh, another larger device. Uh, the, the big problem with 3D printing is that's much more expensive when you uh, make larger pieces because it kind of that 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 volume factor, the cube of the length, really really kills you once you get up to larger pieces. But it's good for small pieces. It's also, however, really good for super complicated things, such as when you hang around with hospital people, uh, 3D printing anatomy. So we have quite a bit of work going here to to 3D print. Um, uh, anatomical models for surgical planning. And actually, we have a, a paper uh, we're preparing right now about the, the value of actually doing this stuff. So that's cool. I do like 3D printing, but I think that 3D printing, from an engineering point of view, is, is kind of uh, uh, oversold. Um, the, the value of it is, is oversold, which is to say it's useful, but it's extremely uh, hyped right now. So, so I think it's a consideration when you're thinking about if you're putting together a prototyping facility, you know, what should you be spending your resources on? Um, I think people are focusing a little too much on that. Uh, traditional machining uh, uh, is something that should also be focused on. And the reason is actually most of the time in engineering, you really want to be using the right material. So these are examples. I have another project I'm not really talking about here called the um, minimally invasive fixation for the pelvis. Uh, we're making a flexible implant that can be stiffened inside a broken pelvis once, in, once it's placed correctly. Um, all of this type of project needs to uh, use correct material, so you're prototyping out of hard stainless or, you know, work hard in 316 implantable stainless, and, and traditional machining uh, is how you do that, uh, and, and to have that capability ultimately is a lot more, um, it's, it's a lot more difficult for a lab to have a good capability in that area than with, than with 3D printing, so it's a cool thing to have. Um, the other key competencies for my engineering group, um, I should, by the way, I should finish by saying that, 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 that we have, with the, with the hospital, we my engineering team can go and make things. I can go make things uh, as needed. But we also have two staff machinists full time at the hospital. Um, and so we, we, we balance where we do a certain amount of stuff on our own, but we send a lot of things to them. And they can turn things, or because they have these product, productive tools, they can turn things around very quickly. So we, we, uh, we can balance our, our engineering design and, and manufacturing activity very well. Um, other key competencies of my engineering team are, are electronics and software development, particularly robot control systems. Electronics is maybe easier than it used to be because Arduino boards um, and other sort of control, uh, microcontroller boards with various inputs and outputs have become really accessible and reliable and easy to use. And, and so we get people up to speed relatively quickly using those kinds of tools. Um, control software is, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, uh, we use typically Visual Studio. Um, and write in C++, uh, for example. Um, and and the, the main thing there is, you know, you can make nice interfaces, but then iterating the interfaces uh, after you interact with users is the big part. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, finally, uh, I want to talk about our current projects. Now, now tumor uh, uh, content, maybe, okay, what you can say is we've, we've, uh, we feel we're pretty good at uh, uh, the process of library construction and the automation around library construction right now. Um, so, so now we're thinking, what is the, the next problem? Well, if you're a cancer clinic, you, you really find that the next problem is how do we guarantee high tumor content in sequencing? So when I, I, I want to be sequencing tumor when I'm sequencing tumor, and if I'm going to sequence normal, which I can get from a blood sample, I want to be sequencing normal. Um, so what, what biopsies look like is something like this. You'll have some, this is a piece of tissue resected. I think this is an oral cancer. Um, and you'll have uh, this section. On, on the right, you'll see the formalin fixed paraffin embedded block uh, that's been then sectioned and stained. So what you see on the left is a stained slide. And the, the pathologist has identified tumor uh, somewhere around the uh, top and bottom. Um, sorry, he's identified, or she in this case, has identified uh, tumor at the bottom and normal at the top. And uh, maybe we don't have a blood sample because the patient that we're studying here is deceased, so we want to get a normal and a tumor. So we would go and extract normal at the top and tumor at the bottom. Typically, we mostly are extracting tumor, and if the patient's alive, we get a blood sample. Um, so, so the problem then is how do you actually physically extract that tissue, and how do you do that in a way that's scalable so you can do it a whole lot? Um, we we want to have consistently high tumor content. Uh, and the reason we want to have consistently high tumor content is, is 
because you really can't make good variant calls or have good limited detection for a rare variant um, if you don't have good tumor content. Um, and that's particularly true when you start to work with RNA where the signal is kind of monotonically a function of how much uh, tumor content you have. Um, we, we need to imagine also how do we scale this thing? So, so it's one thing to hand carve a chunk of tumor out of a formula fixed block, but if we're talking about the you know 10,000 metastatic cancer cases in British Columbia, which has a population of about four and a half million, or 25,000 cancer cases, what can we do for those things? You can imagine you're 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 um, you're, you're scaling a lot. So currently we're doing, as I say here, we're doing about 5,000 uh, clinical next gen panel sequencing samples, and uh, uh, probably only about. 2,500 of those are, are, are from biopsies, the others are from blood for hereditary, and then about um, 800 of this personalized oncogenomic samples. Um, so so these, are, these are the kind of things where we want to raise tumor content. Um, so uh, you could, if you're going to raise tumor content, uh, do laser capture micro dissection, uh, or, or some kind of, actually it could be any kind of dissection, you could actually take a knife and cut part of this tumor out, but it depends on the level of, of intermixture between tumor and normal. Or you could potentially just go over and take a core, um, and if you take a core, you're assuming it's like drilling, it's like, it's like when you go and find gold on the surface of a mountain, and then you drill a hole where the gold is on the assumption that there's likely to be more gold uh, under the gold on the surface than there is some, in a, some other random location on the mountain, but you can't quite tell for sure. So, so coring is actually done commonly as a way to quickly get uh, what is probably a higher tumor content. Uh, but we want to think about whether laser capture uh, is, a, is a viable alternative. Um, once you, if you do coring, by the way, then you can potentially disaggregate and sort nuclei if you want to study individual nuclei or, or characterize the nuclei before you go into sequencing. We'll talk about that too. Um, so we raise tumor content by laser capture microdissection. Um, and the way we're doing, the way we're proposing or, 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 or now working on doing that is by taking the most tedious part of laser capture, which is mapping out the boundary of the region of interest and automating that. Um, we're also automating coring of formalin fixed tissue uh, by, uh, sorry, we're automating the coring of formalin fixed tissue for clinical panels. So, so this is actually uh, taking the part where cores are currently manually done um, and doing that on a robot. And then we're doing automated disaggregation of tissue to characterize tumor content. Um, and I'll uh, talk about all these things. So the, the problem of boundary mapping is, is this. We have a, a section. And you can see here that, say, all of the darker purple stuff on the right side of this biopsy is actually a uh, tumor, and the rest is normal. So the tumor content here might actually be well below 50%. Um, what we need to do then is we're, we need to target uh, several square millimeters. Um, we need about, uh, actually, th these numbers are a little low on the slide here. We need, we need a, uh, 100 nanograms or ideally a little bit more than that. Um, so we need a few square millimeters. We can get about 10 nanograms per square millimeter um, out of uh, this, this stuff. What we do then is we, uh, what, if we have software, and in fact, we've, this, is, this is some basic uh, 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 work in, in, in MATLAB, but we've actually discovered now there's, there's a variety of, uh, quite a lot of open source tools and actually algorithms out there. And so we're working up, kind of taking some best practice, practice open source algorithms um, and, uh, and, and building that into, into improved software that we can um, go and target, uh, say, the purple region and train then, it, the, the, get the software to then identify all of the other regions. Say I've, I've, I've identified my, my blue region as the region of interest, um, and my orange region is the region of normal. Uh, and I've done that because I'm a I have a pathologist who, who knows what they're looking at when they, when they, when they do this. Um, and then what the software does is it then goes out and populates the whole rest of the slide and tells you what's the region of interest. Uh, which uh, that in this case is blue, and, and which is region normal, which is orange, and then you can draw a boundary around the blue part and then extract it. Um, so we're in the process right now of just uh, uh, of doing our first tests using uh, samples for which we have whole tumor sequencing of the normals, uh, of the equivalent normal, and we're going to be sequencing primaries. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be very much taking samples similar to this, um, and extracting several square millimeters of the uh, of, of the of the uh, tumor region, um, and uh, then be able to compare that against the normal uh, uh, to make sure that we have you know good quality sequence. Um, the automated coring uh, this is kind of the fun part of uh, an overall pipeline where 
you have, so, so this is for a, a panel sequencing of your sort of uh, KRAS and BRAF type genes that are, are commonly used in, in, in cancer diagnostics. Uh, these have been all done by single point uh, PCR tests in the past, and so the goal has been to merge a lot of these things onto one panel, and in fact, ultimately including some RNA fusions. Um, the, the source material for these things is FFB biopsies, and what happens right now is that a slide goes to a pathologist uh, the space will be sectioned off the end of the of, of the tissue block. The, the, they they take a pen and they circle the region of interest. This goes back to the lab, and they core the 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 technologist manually aligns the slide and the block and does a coring operation. Um, so what we're doing here is we're automating that step. Um, and so this is this is kind of cool. Uh, you'll see here that in the in the software, then you bring the slide back from the pathologist, and they've got some. And it's not shown here, but they will have some some mark, and you align the slide and the block digitally, and then target. Now this is this will be done as best as possible in an automated way, but the the, the technologist can can assist it, uh, and then we target a region, and then the coring robot will come over, and you see these tools on the lower right corner will come in and and core the robot and core the block, and then drop the sample into a tube, um, ready for extraction. So, uh, sorry. So the, the 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 cool part of this, from an automation point of view, is is the coring bit where you are taking, uh, you know, you're doing all this automated um, uh, registration of the slide and the block, and then you're identifying the, the position on the block to core, and then you're going and coring it, and and that's a gateway to some improved digital uh, automation of that. Where, for example, the the, the hopefully in, in the near future, the pathologist will be able to identify the region of interest. Uh, Met, uh, using uh, like on, uh, um, on a computer, and then we'll just get a digital uh, coordinate back rather than having the physical slide come back. Um, and then ultimately, maybe there can be automated um, identification of the location of interest, and then we go and core. The, the main purpose of the robot, the coring part, will improve productivity in the lab somewhat. It certainly improve, improves tr uh, traceability fairly dramatically. But really, it also then allows us to to then on top of that implement an automated extraction protocol in the in the lab in the, the clinical lab. Um, and then ultimately, uh, we'll we'll have also our automated um, uh, library construction and capture kind of all on one robot. Um, currently, what's done is is manually the extraction is done manually after the coring is done manually, and then the, the DNA comes down here uh, to the genome center from the clinical lab, and we do amplicons. So so this robot is actually part of a of a larger uh, plan to automate several steps and have it all up at the clinical lab and, and enable them to scale the number of tests that we do annually uh, to some degree. Finally, uh, we, we are interested in the use of uh, FFPE tissue uh, as a tool for archival studies. So you have all of these vast numbers of samples that are in warehouses that, that are from past cases. You, uh, don't have the, you don't have a blood normal uh, for those patients because the patients are deceased or whatever. But you, if you could get a normal and a tumor sample out of these blocks um, and you had some uh, data on the patient treatment and outcome like and then correlate that with molecular profiles that you get from sequencing, you can imagine you have an enormous resource. Um, and so, in order to enable the use of that, and by the way, we we feel here in British Columbia we can we can access those resources. It's a matter of funding for these types of projects, but we can access those resources, and and, and we collaborate well with with our, our clinical partners in this. Uh, but technically, what do you need? Well, one thing is to is to assess whether you actually have a normal and a tumor. Um, and get your tumor content, um, or, or make sure your tumor content and your normal um, are satisfactory. So what we're doing, what we're going to do here is, 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 is say, take these sections. Now, now th this is a thing that's sort of working in parallel to the laser capture method of raising tumor content. So this, this has some advantages and disadvantages, um, and we're going to do both of them and see which kind of comes out better. Uh, this one certainly can work potentially with more material, um, but it's harder to actually change the tumor content if your tumor content is off. Uh, what we're doing then is we is we we bring in cores, we disaggregate them, and we have some automated methods for disaggregating them into individual nuclei. Um, it's very hard to get cells out of FFPE, by the way, or fresh frozen for that matter. It's much easier to get the nuclear uh, because the cell walls kind of stick together, so you you get nuclei out. Um, and then we can actually take little aliquots of these things, and we can drop them onto a slide, and we can image them. And in fact, on our robots, we can image we can actually drop 96 of these onto a slide, so we can make an automated uh, pipeline of coring output into disaggregated tissue and then into little aliquots that get spotted onto a slide and then image. And this is an example of a few cells. And then we have, uh, working with Callum McCauley's lab, we were colleagues at the Cancer Research Center here, 
we uh, they've developed software to, to do automated analysis of these of these cells, um, and so it can actually subdivide cells. These these are two sets of cells. They've been imaged and then subdivided into 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 um, uh, normal and and cancerous, and this is the same scale. So you can see that the ones on the left are are much larger. These are relatively easy to identify compared to the right ones, which are the ones on the right, which are normals. But it can then tell you your content of the normals and your content of the tumor. Um, so so that will then enable us at, a, at large scale to potentially prepare large numbers of samples of which the tumor normal uh, tumor content and the normal content is known, um, which would be very helpful for these large scale studies. Um, so these are. I've described a number of, uh, of automation projects that we've done, and I think we've, we've, we've learned some lessons that are, I mean, these may be obvious lessons, but uh, they're, they're, they're still good lessons, and we still sort of keep finding reasons to think about them and apply them. Um, we do really believe in the, 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 the fast prototyping concept. The, the first version of Barracuda, the size selection robot that we built, went from concept to microRNA library construction in, in five months. So I came back from a conference thinking we needed to build this thing and had it in production for microRNA in five months. Um, the, there was almost no CNC machining required to make that prototype. Everything that we, we used on the robot was either purchased or scavenged, uh, like, in other words, commercially manufactured parts, um, and, uh, or it was made on, uh, in our 2D prototyping pipeline. Um, and, and so this is, I think, particularly in automation, this concept of 2D prototyping where you're water jetting stuff or you know, primarily uh, cutting stuff out that way is, is particularly good in, in the case of when you're building automation because there's so many components of, for automation that are commercially available. You can put together almost everything you need except for your sort of specialized deck components, and, and, uh, and it, it's very, very efficient. Um, and then actually a realization that you, you try not to build your own robot, rather do an add-on to an existing robot. So in the case of Barracuda, uh, we, we started with a deceased Cupix. So this goes back to about 2006. The robot was older than that. We actually pulled the stages out of it and left them on a shelf until 2009. We started building Barracuda 1. And then we had to build a chassis that looked exactly like the original Cupix chassis because, of course, the robot's a certain shape, and you're going to use the robot according to the shape it has. Um, then we built another uh, backup versions of Barracuda called Barracuda 2, and we had to then recreate this scavenge thing using because we, we'd scavenged these these stages and built the chassis, and then we then we had to use new stages because we couldn't get more of the older stages, and so we had to build new stages and a new chassis. But when Coastal Genomics uh, started to become an idea, the spin-off company that took and has commercialized the size selection technology, um, it was realized that actually we could adapt a, a commercial liquid handler to do this. Um, and in fact, the, the, the Hamilton Nimbus in this case. And not only that, but we could then go from having one pipette tip and loading the samples one at a time to loading the samples 12 at a time. Uh, and, and subsequent to that, we realized that, that in fact, other projects we want to do, it's going to be easier to adapt a commercial liquid handler to the application rather than building a custom solution. And then that also gives you the advantage of the downstream liquid handling options uh, that, that you can use. And so if you, that coring robot that I was describing earlier, that unit is uh, a, another Nimbus that uh, we are able to actually make it, we have a special tool that we've made that can, the gripper can grab the, 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 the pipette tip holder, the, the array of 96 uh, mandrels can grab this tool and go and core FFP uh, blocks and drop off these, 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 these cores and then we drop that tool, and we can pick up with the same head regular pipette tips and do regular liquid handling. And so this means you can build a, a essentially two robots in one. Um, and from a from a com commercialization point, it's just the, the practicalities of not having to build a very complicated and expensive machine, uh, which you then have to support, uh, is, is is extremely attractive. And finally, uh, and I think. This is quite well known to everybody, but it's interesting in the context of robots that, that robust software takes time. And the interesting thing about it for me, especially being somebody who's more mechanically oriented, is that it, it takes much longer to develop robust software than it takes to develop robust hardware. So we sort of feel now that it takes five times longer to uh, make the software sort of a final version compared to making the mechanical part of the robot uh, essentially, or any, for that matter, the electronics, the final version. So uh, that that's quite a um, uh, an important concept that you have to to uh, to schedule in or or think about when you're doing your development cycles. And so, for example, with our coring robot, we have a plan to to get it working at a basic level and be able to deliver it to the clinic for 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 initial validation after say six months. This is a funded project, and and then. 
uh, there's maybe 18 months or two years of, of, of iterative development um, that may involve then actually going out and, and getting subsequent funding to do further development. Um, but we can keep iterating it and improving not only the robustness of the software, but the, the, the user interface. And so it works maximally well for the users. Um, having said that, and I think this is also an important point here, that in-house devices can run in an underdeveloped state if the developers are in the same building during production operations. I think a lot of uh, places actually do this. A lot of factories uh, that have their own equipment do this. And it's, it's, a, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. But if you're going to send something out in the wild, you certainly are looking at that five times more labor than your, than your mechanical component. On that note, I shall close. I'd like to thank particularly my group, Steve Pleasance and Dwayne College, uh, uh, Dwayne Spilas, sorry, Philip Sal and Colin Schlosser, and our uh, technology development partners who do methods development here at the GSC and, and all my other colleagues who work with. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that informative presentation, Robin. We want to get right to the audience's questions and input. So here's a reminder to the audience as to how you can communicate with us. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button at the lower left. If you are unable to get to your questions due to time constraints, Robin will reach out to you via email. So let's take a look at our first audience questions. We have one here that says, are you doing any smaller volume pipetting? In library construction, no. <laughs> Sorry, in, uh, small volume pipetting, not in not in in general library construction at this point. Uh, no, we're not sort of doing say trying to do large numbers of, of library constructions for uh, uh, say bacteria, which is you know need to be low cost. Um, although that's an interesting area. We, we have been looking at low volume pipetting um, for uh, um, single cell genomics. And so can you scale down? I mean, I, I think uh, other people have, have, have demonstrated this, uh, but, but, but thinking about methods development for, for uh, single cell uh, RNA-seq and potentially uh, meth, um, uh, chip seq, for example. Uh, and so, so yeah, we are looking at that um, and, and, and working with some sub-microliter uh, or say some nanoliter pipetting uh, using nano wells size plates and I think that's an interesting area. We have one more question from our audience members. What are the future developments in library construction for you? Uh, well one, one area that's I mentioned during the talk that we hadn't really uh, uh, looked at automating incubations. Um, and I think actually there, uh, upon reflection and upon, uh, you know, being at some recent conferences and, and, and so forth, the, there is certainly now uh, the thought that the next step is to, uh, is to look at more of what we might call fully walkaway automation, um, where you're going you're gonna to actually automate not only uh, sort of setting up incubations, which maybe means some kind of liquid cover slip. It means ideally you could, and, and this is particularly true working with some of our partners, um, like the Center for Disease Control locally here, uh, could you get away from um, you know, separate equipment for shearing and do, do shearing on deck with, with chemical or enzymatic means? And if you can do that, um, you know, then can you basically do really end-to-end -end automation? Uh, so, so that's an area that uh, I think there's a bit of development uh, or that there's fruitful development to be done. One, one thing there is really the, the robot programming, the, the, the error handling or, or checking to make sure that you have all your tips and that everything's in the right place uh, is going to become a lot more stringent. So you have to think about whether, you know, do we need to use onboard cameras and then have some intelligence around analyzing your, you know, taking a picture of your tips and making sure all your tips are in place or being able to image the wells that you're working on and make sure that thing, it looks correct. Uh, so we have to think about some of those things. Thank you, Robin. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with the audience before we close today? I have, I have a lot of passion for this area, uh, and I, I'm, I thank you for listening. And I hope that uh, uh, you know you got something something out of it. I, I think uh, you know all of us who work in automation uh, in, in, in for life science, it's a it's a really exciting area, and it's it's always exciting to share uh, things that we've done within our labs. Uh, for other people.
Thank you, Robin Coop. I'd also like to thank Lab Roots for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on demand until August 2017. Keep an eye out for an email from Lab Roots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We encourage you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.